in this talk I speak about museums. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge in England and as such I don't represent any of these museums. All of the information regarding the museums represents my own opinions. Often when we think of history we think of listening to knowledgeable people and often we think of reading about the past. Sometimes we think of history in the monuments that people create. And occasionally, history lays in places that we don't often think to look. Living here in beautiful Pompeii, you are surrounded by history. But this talk is to introduce you to more clues of Micronesian history that are overseas in museums. Some museums in countries like England and America have Micronesian items. Most of them were collected a really long time ago, but some were collected recently. My PhD considers how Pacific Islanders developed and maintained their individual and collective identities in the increasingly cosmopolitan world of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Islands like Pompeii and Kosrai offer great case studies as in the 19th century, their people began to interact with a wide range of outsiders, such as Spanish, Germans, Japanese, and many Pacific Islanders. A good way to look at how people's identities change over time is to look at changes in clothing. What we wear is always tied to our sense of identity. I'm an archeologist and archeologists use material culture to understand the past. Most people think of us digging items out of the ground or mapping our buildings and other structures. But textiles do not often survive in the archaeological record in rainy, humid places like Pompeii. As such, I've conducted most of my PhD research by looking through overseas museum collections, um, which were collected in the 19th and early 20th century. It took a long time, but I've tracked down hundreds of different articles of clothing from Kosrai and Pompeii. I've recorded many of the designs and patterns on these textiles, and I'm using archaeological statistics to group different types of textiles together and to chart changes to their patterns over time. Eventually, I will compare this data to other vessels of identity, such as graves, and how they changed over time. But because I found museum collections super useful in my own research, in this talk, I wanted to share how they were formed in the first place. I also want to emphasize the possibilities that they hold for you and how they can help you to answer questions that you might have about the past. So with significant help from Bernice Pauahi Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii, and the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Cambridge, I bought a mobile museum display of 13 item photographs to Pompeii. This display shows 11 of the textiles that I've been looking at, as well as a Kosrayan warping board and a shell ads from Namadol. To begin with, the Pompeii Public Library very kindly hosted the display, and then it was moved to the uh, Learning and Resources Center of the College of Micronesia's Library. The display was printed on special humidity resistant boards to help with the climate to be here for two months in the best possible condition. And uh, it was graphically designed by Dr. Mara Mulrooney and two professional photographers, Dr. Jesse Stephen and Josh Murphy, kindly took the photos. So the textiles in the photos are fascinating. Some of the textiles from Kosrai were originally made to be loincloths and some were used as ribbons or hat bands. They are called toll. Originally, everyone in Kosrai wore them as their main clothing. Toll usually had a black middle and often had colorful ends that showcased an intricate knotting technique. Kramer and Kramer Banau from the German South Seas expedition were told by Kosrai informants that different toll patterns existed for different people in different occasions, such as fisher people or priests. And you can see here how incredible and vibrant these patterns really are. However, over time, Khosrayan women innovated and created new types of toll, including loincloth toll that deviated from the norm. 
So we can see here the change um, from the black middle into a striped middle. As Khosrayans indigenized Christianity, they began to wear clothing that covered more of the body, but they continued to make toll um, in the form of tourist pieces, hat bands, and ribbons. This basic transition has been well documented in the past by researchers such as Kramer Banau and Kramer, and Deegan and Cordy. In Pompeii, men originally wore grass skirts and women wore bark cloth wraparounds. However, Pompeian women used the same technique that Khosrayan women used to make toll, to make a different type of textile called a thor. Thor were used as the ceremonial belts of chiefs. And, uh, sorry, <laughs> thor were less colorful than Khosrayan toll. Um, employing mainly red and a light yellow, but they were just as symbolically intricate. The designs on door were specific to individual chiefs, and anyone caught wearing the wrong belt would be severely punished. Door were popular items with outsiders, um, but because of their association with chiefs, there are far less of them in museums today than there are at all. When I performed an initial statistical analysis, of toll in 11 different museums, I located only 25 <coughs> confirmed or, but 152 confirmed toll. Chiefs wore door over their grass skirts, called gol. Gol were another popular item for outsiders to collect. In black and white photos, it may be the door that really stands out. But in museum collections, we can see that gol were also finely made and beautiful. One gold that I saw in the National Museum of Scotland was dyed a vivid yellow. The dried strips of plant fiber had been individually crimped, and it had a trim that was made of bright red trade wool with a beaded tassel. This highlights the importance of looking at museum collections. In black and white pages of history books, we can often get a quite different impression of an object. Both toll and door were made by women using the same technique, and they were woven from fiber using banana stalks. We are very fortunate that in the early 20th century, a German woman called Elizabeth Kramer Banau sat down with Khosrayan women and recorded the technique. Here are some of her drawings illustrating how women made them. However, although she was by far the most comprehensive recorder of toll and door techniques at the time, uh, many other people were also interested in documenting how these textiles were made. For example, the Micronesian collections at Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford in the United Kingdom holds a large collection of looms as well as the kinds of thread that women used to weave the clothing and even shells and crab claws that were used as tools and weights in the weaving process. For its part, in 1932, my university's museum, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, acquired a warping board that Kramer Banal's husband bought. If you compare closely between the drawings, her drawing and the photo of the object, you can see that the two warping boards are very much alike. Women stopped weaving toll and door in the early 20th century, and as their delicate fabric does not fare well in the humid climate, particularly over 100 years, only a few remain on the islands. Even in the climate-controlled environment of museums, I have seen many toll and door that are gradually fraying, particularly in areas that are dyed black, as the old dye creates a volatile reaction with the fabric. Luckily, museum specialists have developed techniques to sh deal with these problems. In particular, I've seen many toll and door that are backed onto gauze to help keep their shape. And museums often pack textiles flat into long drawers to prevent them from being bent into a shape that they then can't get out of. However, despite the benefits of these objects being cared for in overseas museums, I know that many Micronesians seldom get the chance to see them or learn about them. And it was because of that that I worked alongside Bishop Museum and the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology to bring a small display here. 
uh, this display is a trial and at the end of this talk I hope that you might fill out a survey for me so that I can work with museums to create larger exhibits in the future on topics that you find interesting. So, who collected Micronesian items? How did Pompeian and other Micronesian items actually end up in overseas museums? What do museums do with the objects? How can people from all over the world view them? And what sort of questions can be answered through analysing these collections? In the 19th century, many different people, like I've said, started arriving in Pompeii and Kosrai. Each of these the people who arrived on the island had their own culture and their own objects, animals and diseases that they brought with them. But many of the people who came to Pompeii and Kosrai were also interested in Pompeian and Khosrayan culture. Often, these people were engaged in collecting items. So, one of the types of people that came and collected items were scientific expeditions. Some people visited Pompeii and Khosrayi as part of broader scientific expeditions across the Pacific. In particular, colonizing forces were interested in surveying new people that had come under their control. Good examples of such excursions are the German South Seas Expedition and the Japanese Imperial University of Tokyo Expedition, both in the early 20th century. Through translators, numbers of scientific expeditions asked Pompeians and Khosrayans about their culture. They were also keen to collect what they saw as representative examples of people's culture and the natural environment that people lived in. As such, the collections of these research expeditions should not only excite people that have an interest in history, but those with an interest in island biosystems, marine science, and other scientific disciplines. The research expeditions also often took photos and made drawings and maps. However, not all of their collections are listed or pictured in the publications that they brought out. As such, a true exploration of the materials requires museum research. As most research projects wrote about their findings in long monographs, you can learn where the collections were originally deposited. While many of these monographs were originally written in languages such as Russian or German or Japanese, over the years, many people, including academics at Bishop Museum in Honolulu, have worked to translate them into English. You can find many of these translations available in the Pacific, collections of the Pacific Collection of the College of Micronesia. Occasionally, finding out exactly where these collections are now can be a bit of a trick, as institutions where the researchers deposited the items may no longer exist, may have had a name change, or been assimilated into another institution. But I find that a quick Google search can really help with working out where the items are now. It's well worth a shot. Perhaps paradoxically, some of the most prominent collectors of Micronesian items in the 19th century were missionaries, particularly of Khosrai and Tol. This is interesting as missionaries often encouraged people to adopt Western clothing. However, they also developed long-lasting relationships with people and encouraged material culture traditions that they considered fulfilled the role of handicrafts. In particular, Marshallese women and girls who came to Khosrai under the mission, taught Khosrayan women to make hats, which had never been previously made in Khosrai. Perhaps this also encouraged the transformation of loincloth toll into hatband toll. We know that missionaries encouraged the production of hatband toll because they were often sold to fund the mission. Christian in 1899 and Matsumura in 1918 both wrote that Khosrayan hatbands became a rage in Honolulu and were sold from shops there to trendy ladies. <laughs> it would be easy to say that as Khosrayans indigenized Christianity and ceased to make loincloth toll in favor of ribbon and hatband toll, that the new symbols on their fabrics changed to being more Christianized. But if we look at some of the new motifs here, we can see that the mission taught Western writing was being used as well as crosses, octograms, stars and what may be a dove, all of which might be considered Christian symbols. However, in an increasingly cosmopolitan society, many of the new symbols can have alternative meanings. Take, for example, the Maltese cross that occasionally appears on toll. 
While a cross can be considered as Christian in origin, the Maltese cross was not always a Christian symbol in the Pacific. That, for example, the cross was present on a toll which was traded into America in 1905. As such, it could have represented something similar to the German Iron Cross, as Germany was the colonial power overseeing Khosrae at the time. Furthermore, designs that re resemble Maltese crosses also appear in Pacific Island tattooing. For example, the anthropologist Firth noted in Tikapia that a motif that used singularly is that called C. Farako and is somewhat in the shape of a Maltese cross. This was emphatically said to be an ancient Tikapian design, not derived from a Christian influence. Within my thesis, I am tracking the origins of each motif to plot how Khosrains were engaging with new symbolic repertoire of myriad outsiders. So, so far I've not seen a similar change in Pompeii and Dor. This makes sense as Thor were created for chiefs and apparently their designs were appropriate to specific lineages. However, we do see that Khosrayan women, and um, like Khosrayan women, Pompeian women began to incorporate outside materials into their weaving. On this Thor, which is currently held in the Museum Volkenkunde in the Netherlands, we can see the use of outsider beads alongside Pompeian beads and red wool aside locally dyed fabric. Missionary collections represent some of the most comprehensive collections of Micronesian artifacts in the world. However, they tend to lean heavily towards missionary sanctioned crafts. Items collected by missionaries are often found in areas of the world that were located where the missionaries originally came from, where they settled after they got back, and missionary bases. As such, Many items from Khosrai and Pompeii have made their way into Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii. A journey through the Bishop Museum archives indicates that largely due to the involvement of missionaries, the museum became one of the best suppositories of Micronesian items in the world. Rose stated in a memorandum in 1976 that Bishop Museum has become a kind of focal point for Micronesian materials after the mission's early involvement there. In particular, it holds a missionary collection from the American Board of Commissions, Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which was one of America's first missionary groups. So, collections in Micronesia were also made by individual collectors whether they be explorers or traders or whalers or others. Here I've chosen two British men to talk about. C.F. Wood and F.W. Christian. Wood and Christian made their way through Pompeii and Khosrai, uh, <laughs> Khosrai in uh, a short period of time and were very forward about their approaches to gaining local artifacts. And Christian even conducted a short excavation at Nambadol. Both Wood and Christian sold their collections to museums. Their collections were harder to track down than those of research expeditions and missionaries, as they are not all held in the same place. In the museum display, I included an ad that Christian had excavated from the Ambedol. I'm not studying this item, but I found it particularly engaging because of the life history that it had after leaving the island. It moved from England from Moyes Hall Museum in Bury St Edmunds to the Centre of Anthropology at the British Museum to finally the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at Cambridge. However, despite the difficulties that I had in tracking down these collections, both Christian and Wood wrote about their assemblages and Christian published many photos of the items he acquired. This means that in searching through museum collections in Britain, I was able to match items that I had found with his images. Excitingly, this meant that I could match the items with the actual people that Christian interacted with. For example, Christian had a toll made for him in Khosrai especially. In fact, he had a number of toll made for him especially. Um, but this particular one has the names of the makers woven into it. This links us directly to the individuals that made the toll. Christian writes, and I really apologize to people from Khosrai here or people that speak Khosrai about the way I'm going to pronounce the names, but in the king's household for the last two or three days, the fair maidens Kini, Kusui, and Notui have been hard at work producing specimens of their delicate fabric 
gifts for their guest to take away to his bleak northern home. Here, in the National Museum Scotland's online database, we can actually see one of the names of the makers. I travelled to Edinburgh in Scotland to visit this toll. Presumably, descendants of the makers still live on Cosrai. I've seen many Micronesians excited to see the photos of their ancestors that are housed in overseas museums thanks to Dr. Takuya Nagaoka's face work on Facebook. It is exciting to think that Micronesians also might be able to connect with the talents and skills that their ancestors had in viewing objects that we know the makers of, like this toll. Because we know the story of Kosrain woman making toll directly from Christian, we can make sense of other toll with women's names on them, and there may even be scope to work out exactly who they were. This toll from Bishop Museum has the name of a woman, Sipe, on it who was clearly very keen for the person who bought her toll to remember that it was made on the island of Kosrai. Ribbon toll weren't the only items that Micronesians made, especially for outsiders. I'm sure that many of you have seen model boats, particularly on the second floor of the library here. Models today seem like, may seem like children's toys or ornaments, or a way in which to easily visually compare between, two, between different boat types. However, in the past, models provided a very convenient way of photographing which what would have been a very large and awkward object and possibly floating in water to photograph and put into a research project. In this photo from Matsumura, he uses a model boat as a picture to explain the dynamics of a real boat. He does not discuss model boats in the main text. The Burke Museum in the US has a truly impressive collection of model boats from Micronesia, if anyone is interested in checking them out. The boats weren't the only models that Micronesians made in the past. There are many other different types of models too that you may be interested in viewing. These are models such as houses, fish traps, and even beds. Old models of things like houses are now important because they are in 3D, whereas a photo cannot preserve every side, or the technique of construction. The Smithsonian Institution's online catalogue, which I really recommend to check out, uh, reveals that it has a surprising array of models, including a bed of King John of Kosrai, a Pompeian model fish trap, and a ghost canoe from Truk. So, having said all of this, what do museums actually do with Micronesian objects? Well, the most obvious thing that overseas museums do with Micronesian objects is to display them to represent islands like Pompeii to their visitors, many of whom may never have heard of the island before. Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England, currently has two chiefly Thor on display as part of its exhibit on displays of chiefly power in the Pacific. But sometimes objects from Micronesia are used to tell a larger story. For example, one of the Pompeian Thor, a chief's belt that is held by the Bishop Museum, was owned by Kalakaua, the last king of Hawaii. It is currently on display and it is noticeable that it was one of his beloved items or things that he took good care of. I find it poignant that this carefully crafted chiefly belt from Pompeii became a treasured item of the king of another Pacific island. This process of Micronesian representation and collection did not end in the past, but is ongoing. Leon Pompey, an historic preservation officer, well, office Pompey cultural anthropologist, Emily the Killing, who is sitting here, acquired Oros for Te Papa Tongawera's Pacific textile collection while she was the curator for the Pacific cultures in 2011. <laughs> Te Papa Tongawera is, is New Zealand's national museum in its capital city, Wellington. So who knows, perhaps the next time you give a Micronesian gift to a friend from overseas that you could consider that one day they might leave it to a museum. So I've spoken of the ways in which museums work to conserve artifacts like textiles and I've talked about how they display them 
So now I will jump straight into the ways in which museums facilitate research and community visitations, just in case you ever decide to travel to somewhere um, with a museum with a large Micronesian collection. Museums have many items on display, but they also store far more items in carefully monitored storage facilities. In order to perform research in museums, or visit them, it is necessary to write a proposal of what you want to study or view. Once this has been approved, sometimes you must go through a security clearance process, as well as signing forms on the proper use of the information that you gather. While working in a storage facility in a museum, you usually must leave your bag at the door, only write in pencil, and sometimes wear gloves, and be monitored by trained museum staff. Micronesian items are spread in museums all over the world. Some museums, like Bishop Museum in Honolulu, have many kinds of the same type of items. However, most museums that hold Micronesian items only have a couple of representative types of each artifact. This means that studying the same type of artifact, like I, I'm doing, can be very hard. In the past, in order to research items, one had to find a museum collection large enough to make a representative study. Uh, Riesenberg and Gayton performed a, such a study on 24 Caroline Island textiles in 1952, which are now held in the Phoebe A. Haast Museum at the University of California, Berkeley, and the Smithsonian Institution. However, as I previously mentioned, certain cities tend to attract certain kinds of items, such as those involving missionaries or those involving research groups, so getting a full suite of items that represent those collected by different types of people can be hard. In the case of objects from Kompang Kozrai, it would involve traveling all over the world as Micronesians interacted with such vastly different people over the course of a couple of hundred years. The fact that Micronesian items exist, usually in small numbers all over the world, was a problem for my own research. Last year I visited five museums, but I don't have unlimited funds, and I was restricted to mostly the places that were nearby where I lived. However, for my stylistic analysis of Toll and Door, one thing has come to the rescue, digitization. Ultimately, digitization is about making museum collections visually accessible to everyone with an internet connection all over the world. Many museums, such as the Smithsonian Institution or the Phoebe A. Haas Museum at the University of California, Berkeley, both in the US, have a large section of their collections available to view online. However, in conducting research projects, it is also possible, if you can't find what you're looking for, to contact the Pacific curator in the museum that you're interested in to see if they can send you a spreadsheet of the items that they have, or perhaps even send you photos or literature on the items that they hold. Digitization in museums can often take a long time, and this might be why if you go online you don't see the full list of artifacts that a museum holds. I know this because it took me two months to help Bishop Museum make a digital inventory of 5,000 archaeological objects from all over Micronesia. However, many museums have embarked on this journey, which will take a long time but will ultimately be of immense profit to all of us, including Bishop Museum, led by Dr. Mara Mulroney, which has a project called Ho'omaka Ho, which in Hawaiian means to look again, which has in part comprised of the digitization of thousands of Pacific Island artifacts with the ultimate goal of getting those photos and information online. So finally, why, again, why look at muse Micronesian museum collections online, particularly if you're a student? As I mentioned previously, by reading historic texts, you can figure out where museum collections associated with the person or group who wrote the texts are held. While I've studied Pompeian books, I have noticed that many later books reproduce the same photos of people and the same photos of artifacts from older books over and over again. This can make it feel as though there is a limited amount of information fo or photos or visual stimuli about Micronesia. However, this isn't the case. And to enhance your research project and to find new clues about the Pompeian past, you can start to access collection databases with photographs and descriptions of objects that hardly ever appear in history books in order to tell a greater story. 
But online collections do not always have to be about helping your study. As I mentioned when talking about how women wove their names into Khosrau and Toll, obje objects and photographs from museums can connect you with your own intimate past and perhaps even your ancestors. By following pages like Dr. Takuya Nagaoka's Pacifica Renaissance page on Facebook, I've seen the benefits of this firsthand. And as researchers like Dr. Nagaoka have worked to link museum collections of photographs back with descendant communities. By engaging with Micronesian collections, you can also start to think creatively about the future. Recently, I've been inspired by the Pacific Presences project at my university at Cambridge, which often works with artists to create new works of art that were stimulated by access to museum collections. By engaging with past museum collections, we can look forward to creating new works of art and new interpretations of history that may even challenge boundaries and move us forward. Thank you for listening. <laughs>